Behold the power of a waterfall. Water runs from the mountains tall. Take in some, take in all the power of a waterfall. These mountains once locked in ice, squeezed in a glacial vice. When the melt formed new streams, and bashed through boulders and carved ravines. Oh, the power of a waterfall. Water runs from the mountains tall. Take in some, take in all the power of a waterfall. There's famous ones like Niagara Falls, quiet ones like the Seven Tubs. No, the drive takes a while. My favorite is Ohio Pile. Oh, the power of a waterfall. Water runs from the mountains tall. Take in some, take in all the power of a waterfall. Thank you. Who's been to Ohio Pile? All right, it's a real place. See that? Out near, uh, not near anything, is it? It's kind of south of Pittsburgh. It's near West Virginia, folks. That's what it's near. But it's Pennsylvania, and it's beautiful. I have a lot of songs picked about nature. I have a lot of songs picked about local history. And uh, it was a hard thing to do to pick just an hour of music for you all tonight because I write a lot of songs about Pennsylvania. And, uh, but I picked some of my favorites, some of my favorite stories anyway. This is a song about the walking purchase, and you all learned about the walking purchase in middle school. You all did. So I'm sure you're experts and you remember every detail, right? <clears throat> it's the 1730s, and William Penn's sons convinced leaders of the Lenape Indians down near Philly, hey, our dad had a deal with your dads, and the deal was this. You know, we're supposed to get as much land as a man can cover in a day and a half. To this day, a lot of historians cast doubt on that claim, by the way. The claim that William Penn had that deal, they said there's probably not a lot of credibility to this. This was kind of a, a shady land grab is what it was. Very shady. And uh, the natives agreed and said, well, if you say so, you know, we'll honor it. But their idea of a day and a half and what actually took place were two very different things. The Penns put out uh, a contest, basically, and they, they picked three professional runners. Well, I probably shouldn't say professional runners. I don't know if there was such a thing in the 1730s, right? But they got three people who were known for their speed, and they pitted them against each other. And they said, all right, you three are going to run. Whoever gets the farthest gets money and land. The other two get nothing. So the song will tell you what happened to all three of them. And you might be sitting here saying, what's that got to do with Tawanda? You said that's Philly. The people who were then displaced by this land purchase, thousands of native people, the Lenape people, they turned to the Iroquois to the north and said, can we please have permission to settle on the Susquehanna River? And they did for a few decades. And that is why to this day there are still, there are these Philadelphia Native American place names that you find sprinkled down the Susquehanna River. And you think, that's not Iroquois, that, that's not Susquehannock. That's Lenape. Like I went, I went to an elementary school called Mahoning, Mahoning Elementary. Mahoning's down near outside Philly. Well, what's that tell you? It tells you that after this purchase of the 1730s, a lot of those people came here and they brought their names with them. So. Sorry, you wanted a concert. You got a school teacher. I'm sorry. Here you go. Here you go. Here it goes. Here. Three woods men known for being fast Promised land and money if they passed The Indians could hardly keep up And said they never smoked a pipe or stopped to hunt It started at the old chestnut tree Sunrise September 19th Two hours in Jennings was done he never recovered from his run. Run, Yates, run up the Delaware. 
65 miles Not half of them fair I don't fault you Hey, just a hired man In 37 We stole that land On day two, it was Marshall and Yates. They had till noon of that day. Yates fell after a while. Marshall ran 65 miles. That day, Yates lost his sight. Three days later, Yates lost his life. Marshall made it to Mock Chunk. At the end to a sapling he clung Run Yates run Up the Delaware 65 miles Not half of them fair I don't fault you Hey, just a hired man In 37 we stole that land New Tamas felt betrayed by the deal Friends and brothers, they never cheat and steal Marshall never got his land Or the money that was promised by the pen his payback, it took a different form. Indians attacked him on his farm. His son and later his wife paid for the purchase with their life. Run, Yates, run up the Delaware. 65 miles. Not half of them fair I don't fault you Hey, just a hired man In 37 We stole that land Thank you. School teacher, it's going to be a quiz. How many miles did he go? 65 miles. When I wrote the song, I didn't want to just turn it into a black and white picture of this was good, this was bad. It was muddy is what it was. I wanted to celebrate that 65 miles in a day and a half. That's a neat piece of American history right there. I wanted to celebrate that. All politics aside, that's incredible. Now, I said that to an audience a few months ago, and a guy came up to me. He's like, well, Van. I'm part of an ultra runners group, and I just want you to know, 65 miles is not that big of a deal this day and age. I'm like, it was the 1730s, it's in moccasins running through the woods, man. He slept under a hemlock tree at night. Cut him a break. It's incredible. So, there's that. I mean, those of us who, who call ourselves runners, we do a 5K, and we drink Gatorade and hydrate and carb load. What's that, 3.3 miles, and we think we're so tough? So the tragedy, there's so many tragedies in the story. Um, let's get it right. Jennings, he was the first, first runner to fall out. I guess his hips and knees were, they say, ruined for life. They say he never quite recovered. Uh, Yates, the guy I wrote the song for, he died of exhaust. He, he ran so hard he was blind and then three days later was dead. Um, you might say, that's not possible. It happened, folks. He was in his early 20s. How hard does an early 20-year-old need to push their body to die from exhaustion? But he did. And, and uh, the last guy, um, Marshall, who made it all the way to Mock Chunk, Jim Thorpe. Mock Chunk is such a better name, I, I call it Mock Chunk. Uh, he never did get the money that was promised. He didn't get land. And understandably, the Indians were mad, and they couldn't get to the untouchables, you know, the pens. So who could they get to? Marshall on his farm. So they came to kill him. If you heard the last verse, he wasn't, he wasn't home, but who was? Who'd they get? Good job, students. Yeah. Yeah, his wife and son, maybe two sons. I've, I've seen two different histories of that. Um, so 
it, it, someone just connected the dots for me for a, a, there's a Boy Scout connection to this. There's a scout camp down there at the Marshall Farm. And uh, I, I met a teenager who was recently down there, and he said, oh, yeah, they told us this legend that if you go to a certain place at the farm at night, you can hear Mrs. Marshall's ghost. And the, you know, No, you can't, but I'm glad they're at least talking about it. I'm, I think it's good that that story's still alive because I was, I was in Mock Chunk last winter, and I went up on a mountain. To, they actually had the site marked where the, far, that's the farthest they went. They left Philly, and he went 64.8 like miles. And they had the, one of those blue and yellow signs, the Museum Commission, and uh, it's been vandalized and removed, and it hasn't been replaced. So I went to find the site, and I couldn't even find it. The sign's gone. Um, and I thought, I hope this story isn't forgotten. This is an important part of Pennsylvania history. So. I brought a special instrument tonight I'm going to switch over to. You thought it was that, and that's special too. It's this thing. It's this thing. This is called a mouth bow. And uh, I started playing it only recently, about a year ago, and uh, I find that audiences really enjoy hearing it, so I thought I'd bring it for you tonight. It's the first stringed instrument on the planet. And what do you think it was before it was a stringed instrument? <laughs> That's exactly right. This is where it all started. Somewhere, um, thousands of years ago, somewhere, one of our ancestors, singularly, think about it, it was one person picked this up and realized, hey, you can make music with that, and they did. And all the other stringed instruments we have on this planet, piano, banjo, Jimi Hendrix, Beethoven, all of it came from the hunter's bow. I just think that's so cool. Then I started playing it, and you know what I learned? We're one of the last places on the planet where people still play them. And when I heard that, I thought, well, then I need to keep doing this because that's pretty cool. It's like Pennsylvania and down through the, the Appalachians, the southern Appalachians, and then like Papua New Guinea <laughs> over in the Pacific. And we're like the only places left, but people all over the planet used to play these. And in fact, uh, in the colonial era, when Europeans and Africans and Asians were coming to the Americas, this was the only stringed instrument that the Native Americans were playing. They played, they played flutes and woodwinds and they had instruments, but the only stringed instrument was this. We'll catch a fish in the Susquehanna, catch a fish in the Susquehanna, catch a fish in the Susquehanna, sit on the bank in the mud and the sand. Wade right in up to your knees, wade right in up to your knees, wade right in up to your knees, don't go in the winter, you might freeze. Cast your lure and sit and float, cast your lure and sit and float, cast your lure and sit and float, I've seen those bass jump in the boat. If you got young people in your family, you can make these. These are easy to make. They don't need to be flat like mine. Uh, I'm a logger on the side, and I'm embarrassed to say I did what's called barber chairing a tree. You're not supposed to do it. But when I did and it splintered and was all ugly, I grabbed one of those splinters and I made this. Because it needs to be green wood. That's the one thing you want it to be green wood. So, so living wood. It can't be last year's dead stick or it won't bend. Uh, but you can do it with round tree branches. I was at a church camp last year, and they asked me to come sing to the kids. I said, kids don't want to be sung at. Let's have them, you know, make music with me. So we got there and broke out the saws and took some limbs off a maple tree, just went down to the hardware store and got wire, and the kids were all making different size mouth bows. Within 20 minutes, we had a, an orchestra of mouth bows. They had a ball. So I teach agriculture science at Danville High School, and I'm supposed to teach forestry. And one of the key concepts is what's called tension wood, and pressure wood when you're studying a tree because you have to know which side you're cutting. The pressure wood and the tension wood act very differently. And it clicked the other day, oh my goodness. There's the tension wood and on the belly is the pressure wood. So my first week of school with my students, we're gonna be making mouth bows 
And my principal goes, I, what are you doing making musical instruments? You're an ag teacher, I'll say. Show them, kids, the pressure would and, and the tension would. So, but we got to keep this tradition alive. So that's why I, I'm trying to become an advocate for this thing because, like I said, we're one of the last places on the planet people still play this. And I think that we should keep playing it considering it's the first. It's the first stringed instrument. And the last thing I'll say on that is I think the history books have it wrong. They say, you know, thousands of years ago, a hunter sat around the fire and played his, probably his bow. It was a kid. It should say a hunter's kid picked up the bow. You know that that's how it started. Anybody with kids in a family, you know that their hands are on everything. There's no way a grown man went, hmm, I'm going to try the... Everybody in the village would look at him, you know, but a kid, a kid could try it. So, and I just love, and the other thing I love thinking about is once it got established with our ancestors, do you think it was that age old, the older generation criticized young people for how they played mouth bow? Oh, that, that mouth bow you play now is terrible. We used to play good songs in the old days. Give me that thing. And it's no different than us nowadays. So. Last thing, did you notice I didn't slobber on it? I'm not kissing it. You kind of... You put it right up to your cheek, kind of like that, and you change the cavity of your mouth, and that's what's giving you that wah, wah, wah. And if you really want to get fancy, play it sitting down and have it rested on your leg so that you can actually change the tension. That's, that's out of my pay scale. Um, but if you want to see it done by an expert, Buffy Santa Marie, she's still living. She's a wonderful 60s and 70s folk singer. I mean, she's still out there. I shouldn't label her 60s and 70s, but that's when she exploded. And uh, she plays the mouth bow, you can see her on YouTube, and she does that manipulating of the tension, and it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to me. I think it's awesome, but that's the mouth bow. All right, now let's bring it real local. This song's going to bring it local. All right, we did the 1730s. Let's get now to more modern times, the 1760s. Uh, this is right before the American Revolution, and all of a sudden, this part of Pennsylvania is claimed by Connecticut. This really happened. So Connecticut goes to the courts and says, this part is not Pennsylvania, this part is Connecticut. And folks, we had a war over this. It was called the Pennamite War. And, you know, I, I like to be a little smart aleck when people talk about the war between the states. I know what they mean, but I always go, oh, you mean with Connecticut? And they look at you like, what? It really happened. People, I mean, bullets were fired and people fought and died over this argument. And you might be sitting here tonight thinking, well, we obviously won. It's Pennsylvania. Not so fast. Listen to the song. And you'll hear the weird twists and turns that it took. This is a pretty new one. Just put this one out on my newest CD. This is called Hey You Yankee Boy. As I drove through town tonight, I saw a New York Yankees banner hanging off someone's front porch. I thought, wow, they're still here. Those Connecticut Yankees are still here. Well, hey, you Yankee boy, what brings you down this way? Hey, you Yankee boy, there'll be trouble if you stay. Well, I heard you had Lazarus Stewart. He was the leader of the Paxton boys. But if you ran with trash like that, no wonder you were destroyed. Up in Wyoming Valley, the great meadow, it spread out. It was home to some Delaware where the Iroquois allowed. And it's, hey, you Yankee boy, what brings you down this way? Hey, you Yankee boy, there'll be trouble if you stay. Well, they came from Connecticut, and they built their 40 fort, and they claimed it at New England, but the claim fell short. And then men from Pennsylvania with rifles in their hands from Shemokin to Wyoming to see who owned this land. The Connecticut boys, they stopped them, sharpshooters on the bluff. Pennsylvania then retreated. I guess they saw enough. But this world is a strange one. There's always twists and turns. Indians with tomahawks wiped out the 44. And it's, hey, you Yankee boy, what brings you down this way? Hey, you Yankee boy, there'll be trouble if you stay.
By then the revolution spread throughout this land. For a while the Indians held Wyoming land. But after the war years, when the treaties all were done, Pennsylvania got Wyoming where the Susquehanna runs. Now this tale is a strange one of our Pennsylvania home. When men from Connecticut, they claimed it as their own. Oh, blood was shed by rifle and sword, and only a few remember our Panamite War. And it's, hey, you Yankee boy, what brings you down this way? Hey, you Yankee boy, there'll be trouble if you stay. So we didn't win, right? I mean, we didn't. We got, we got licked. My understanding was there were several skirmishes. Started in Shemokin, what you and I call Sunbury with Shemokin. It started there, and then they, the mob went to Danville, and then the mob went to Bloomsburg and Berwick. Come on, we got to go. And they went up, and they went up and put their tail between their legs and came back down to Susquehanna. And then the revolution breaks out. And we kind of temporarily put our differences aside. You know, nothing unites people like a common enemy. And so Connecticut and Pennsylvania kind of put the argument off to the side for then. And whoo, down the river comes the British with a lot of war, Native American warriors. And you have what is known as the Battle of Wyoming or the Wyoming Massacre, whichever you prefer to look at it. And uh, you've heard of Forty Fort, right? That was the fort built by the Connecticuters. Are they call Connecticuters? What do we call them? I don't know. Connecticut's? Connecticutians? I don't know. We'll, we'll solve that later in the concert. But uh, yeah, they, it literally wiped them out. And so you could kind of say anyone that had a, a claim in this land dispute was no longer in, in the equation. So after the treaties were all signed, anyone that really cared from the Connecticut side, they were gone. And so Pennsylvania kind of got it by default. Isn't that weird? Yes. I, good ears. So they had Lazarus Stewart among them who was the leader of the Paxtang Boys. And I'm not a, I'm not a fan of them. Uh, you got it. And Pennsylvanians were split. Half the people wanted the Paxtang Boys to be held accountable for the murder of these totally peaceful Indians. And the other half were like, Indians are Indians. And so there was a lot of uh, dispute. And while Pennsylvania was trying to decide what to do about this, he hightailed it north and joined up with the Connecticut guys. That's what he thought of Pennsylvania. He died in the battle, and his name is there. It's one of the only Pennsylvania names on the monument. That's what struck me. I went to the Wyoming Monument last year. I, I recommend it. You should check it out. It's down in the Wyoming Valley, and it's the only revolutionary battle that happened anywhere near our home, so you really should go see it. Gorgeous stone monument. It has the names of all the Americans killed, and they're just, they're not your Pennsylvania names. They're Connecticut names. But, but there is this Paxting boy up there, Lazarus Stewart. All right, we're going to go into our coal roots now. That display out in the museum uh, showing a Barkley Mountain coal mine is outstanding. It's outstanding. It's so cool. And I know things like that take up a lot of space in a museum, and it's hard to decide when, you're, when you have displays. But I just want to thank the board of directors and everyone involved for having so much square footage in the museum dedicated to coal mining. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'm going to sing you a song that's more about Hazleton area, but it's a, a story that has a lot to do with the entire country. Because what was going on in the late 1800s, and I mean late, this was now 1890s. This was when a lot of Eastern Europeans were coming in. This is when you had your Slovaks, your Poles, your Italians, your Lithuanians coming into our area. And there were all kinds of glass ceilings that would not allow... Eastern Europeans especially, to, to get higher jobs in the mines. They were pretty much kept as laborers. And where it really cracked is when their children started to be abused. In the breakers, um, the breaker bosses would beat on these kids if they didn't think they were working hard enough. And they were getting away with it. And finally it all cracked, and a bunch of the miners went out on strike. And it, it, was, it was less about the, the money, and it was more just about human rights. They said, you're not going to beat our kids. You're not going to keep treating us like second-class citizens. And they went on a peaceful march through the Hazleton area, and all they carried was an American flag. 
There's not a weapon among them. There's photographs to prove this. And when they came to Hazleton, the sheriff came out and said, don't come through town. And they didn't. They listened to the sheriff. They went around town. And for some reason, the sheriff totally changed his mind on the whole situation. And he went and rounded up 100 locals, handed out Winchester lever action rifles. And they just waited in ambush for him. And when they walked into Latimer, the little mining town of Latimer, they mowed these guys down. Uh, Latimer's a little speck on the map. You might not have ever heard of it, but if you remember the actor Jack Palance, he was from Latimer. And, uh, and if you're not good with dates, if my wife were here, she'd say, I don't know all these dates. It was only 10 years before my grandfather was born. This was not that long ago. And so I, I like singing this song because I'm a firm believer if we don't remember our history, we repeat it. And the coal region and Hazleton to this day really struggle with ethnic tensions. Um, and it's not a new thing. But I like, to, I like to remind folks, we've gotten over some real big hurdles in the past. If you don't know your world geography, the countries I just listed, mainly Catholic. And the sheriff of, of Hazleton, his last name was Martin, Pennsylvania German, Protestant. This was, this was at that time a Catholic uh, Protestant rub as much as it was anything else. And I just think, so if there's any silver lining to this story, it's we've pretty much gotten over that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we make progress in this country. Um, I married a Slovak. I'm, I'm a Pennsylvania German, and I married a Slovak. And everyone in my family was cool with that. That's fine. hundred years ago in this area, I don't know that you would have seen too many Germans marrying Eastern Europeans. So there is progress, right? That's what I'm getting at. Eighteen ninety-seven. It's a cold September morning, and there's something in the air today that's chilling me to the bone. Looking out my shack window up by old number nine, you can see some men are gathering as the fog takes its time. Well, there's wives and kids off to the side, and they're waving as they go. There must be 350 of them coming down the road. So I hollered out to one of them, hey, what you marching for? He said, we're marching out of this town and on to Latimer. Said, we're marching on for liberty in this land of the brave and free. I'm sick of living my life like a piece of machinery. Ah, son, I'm sick of living like a second-class human being. We ain't asking for charity, just a little equality. Well, the fog finally rolled away and the sun rose to its peak. Someone said 10 miles have passed beneath our feet. Well, we come from many countries, yes, many foreign lands, but we're waving old stars and stripes to show we're Americans. And then just around Hazelton, up stepped Sheriff Martin. Said, you've come far enough, boys, go back to where you come from. Well, there wasn't no stopping in these men's eyes. You could see right to their souls, their hearts filled with freedom and their lungs filled with coal. Said, we're marching on for liberty in this land of the brave and free. I'm sick of living my life like a piece of machinery. Ah, son, I'm sick of living like a second-class human being. We ain't asking for charity, just a little equality. So the men marched on to Latimer, believing all was fine. Sheriff Martin had him a hundred men, and they were waiting down the line. They were armed with the sheriff's rifles. He had deputized a hundred men, while not a single marcher held a weapon in their hand. And then the sheriff opened fire, and the flag fell to the ground. It's as if God went deaf that day amidst that dying sound. I never seen nothing like it, and I hope I never do again. It's a sin that a dollar weighs more than a man. So for the 19 men that died that day, won't you reach into your soul? Tell me who are the real Americans in this story that we hold? Is it the thugs with the rifles and those badges on their chest? Or those who march for freedom and lay in eternal rest? Said we're marching on for liberty 
in this land of the brave and free. I'm sick of living my life like a piece of machinery. Ah, son, I'm sick of living like a second-class human being. We ain't asking for charity, just a little equality. We ain't asking for charity, just a little equality. I wrote that song after participating in the 100th anniversary march. So that was 1997. So uh, I, I sometimes listen to the lyrics I wrote, and I'm like, ooh, I used some harsh wording here and there. And I, I, was, I was very touched by it. I was 21 years old, I suppose, at the time, and, and got to go. They had the president of the United Mine Workers of America there, Cecil Roberts. Uh, they had a woman there who was portraying Mother Jones. I don't know her name, but she was outstanding. Um, Mother Jones was a wonderful human rights and workers' rights advocate. And uh, they, they told me, they're like, get your banjo and join us. And we marched the final mile where, where the tragedy took place. And it just, it really touched me. And I went back to Penn State, wrote that song in about 10 minutes. And that's, uh, it's, it's amazing to still sing it. And I feel like it's just still relevant. Um, I love that about history, but I also wish some of these things weren't relevant, you know. Let's go to the banjo and sing a song about bears. That won't be as heavy. I had a guy come see me once. He said, man, my wife said we can't go see you as often anymore. I'm like, why? You, you're like all my concerts. He's like, I know. She said, all you sing about is depressing stuff. <laughs> so we're going to change that. I'm going to sing you a song about bears. I love bears. It's not only my first time playing banjo in a prison, it's my first time playing in a prison. This is pretty cool. I was a little boy and we were going to hunting camp and we were going on Interstate 80 by Lock Haven and there's a boulder field up on the mountains. No trees, just rocks. And I said, Dad, what's that all about? And he said, that's a bear spot. And uh, I said, what's a bear spot? And he said, well, on full moons, all the bears in the woods get together, and they have a dance. <laughs> and they dance, you know, big 600-pound bears. They, they wreck all the blueberries and the hemlock, and next morning there's nothing on the dance floor but dust, and it washes away, and you got a bear spot. <laughs> I said, Dad, how do you know that? And he said, well, my dad told me. <laughs> so that's what this song is about. I wrote it with my brother. It's called Where the Bears Dance. <laughs> Up on the mountain, you can see it from the road. There's a field of rocks where nothing seems to grow. My dad told me that's a spot on the hill where the bears come to dance when the moon it is filled. Where they dance, where they dance. Where they dance, where they dance. When the bears dance, the world is asleep. When the bears dance, they stomp down all the trees. Paws and claws and dust from the pines. They got bellies filled with berries and the truest moonshine. Where they dance, where they dance. Where they dance, where they dance. So if you're out camping on an overnight stay and you wander from your camp and you find the bears at play, don't take no photos to prove what you saw. Just join in the good time and dance with them all. Where they dance, where they dance. Where they dance, where they dance. went to Penn State for forestry, and uh, I had a forestry course, 
And the professor loaded us up on buses and took us on a field trip to, I don't remember if it was Bald Eagle Mountain or where we went, to a bear spot. And he gave a lecture on glaciation and freezing and thawing and bedrock and all this stuff. I raised my hand. <laughs> and with a straight face, I told my professor what my dad told me. And he just looked at me. And he kept lecturing. But I guess my point is he never said I was wrong, right? I passed. Goodness gracious. Let me get my harmonica here. I'd be willing to bet there weren't probably too many stringed instruments here at the prison, but I wouldn't know, I'm just guessing. But you know what? They had harmonicas. The harmonica, I've heard some folks say, was like the boombox of the 1800s, and I choose that word because I look at this audience and you know what a boombox is. <laughs> Teenagers now don't, but this was, this came from Germany in the 1860s. They were affordable, so Americans loved them. They were great for working class folks, and they, they fit in your pocket. So when archaeologists often are doing digs at iron furnaces, at railroad depots. They find bits and pieces of, of harmonicas. One of the coolest displays I've seen on that, go to the state park, Greenwood Furnace State Park. It's near State College. They must have half a dozen bits and pieces of harmonicas in their display case. So I want to put a little harmonica music into the program because we, we historians get guilty of taking guitars everywhere and boy you'd think everybody had a guitar in the old days and they didn't not practical. You know, if you were in a logging camp or a coal town, that's no place for a stringed instrument like this. Fiddle, maybe. The harmonica, absolutely. All right, this song is going to touch on the 50th anniversary we're celebrating right now, the flood of 72, Agnes. I won't make you raise your hands and say if you remember it, because it'll tell us all how old you are. But I wrote this during the flood of 2011, which every community's affected a little differently by different floods. And I've noticed like Tawanda Creek has had some really rough floods recently. Uh, but where I live in Danville, 2011 was the big one that I lived through. But you'll hear in the song, I compare it to 72. Because how can you not? That's what all the elders talk about. My whole life, that's all you hear about, flood of 72. All my life, I've heard stories of 72. Hurricane Agnes brought the river up to 32 feet. Well, I thought that that record would stand for all of my life. But the river might hit 32 later tonight. The river looks angry. After four days of rain, she's going to remind us who's in charge again. Got word this morning to go sandbag in town. So we headed over Bald Top Road, the only road still around. Had to bag a wall from Mahoning Creek. By noon, the foreman said we'd hit six feet. The river looks angry after four days of rain. She's going to remind us. Who's in charge again? Well, people come together in a flood from all walks of life. 
I saw a banker on my left and county inmates on my right. If the levee holds, most of town will stay dry. But they don't have a levee across the river in Riverside. River looks angry after four days of rain. She's going to remind us who's in charge again. Well, no one talks about it, though it's on all of our mind. The worst will be the cleanup that comes next week sometime. Well, eventually the mud will dry and town will start anew. It'll just be a legend like the flood of 72. The river looks angry. After four days of rain, she's gonna remind us who's in charge again. As I always tell my students, but don't worry, there'll be no more floods, kids. You know, it's all over. Woo. Not this summer, anyway. My goodness. I'll invite you all down to my town, uh, September 9th, 10th, and 11th. We have the Danville Heritage Festival. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of being involved with that festival is we make education and history first and foremost. In fact, I, I, I can't claim to be as professional as Matt and the folks behind Barkley Mountain Heritage Day, but it felt like a kindred spirit, at least the idea of you go to Barkley Mountain Heritage Day, and it's not about carousels and cotton candy. Don't get me wrong, there's still entertainment for kids and everybody, but it's about history and education. And that's what we try to do in Danville. It's coming up here the 9th, 10th, and 11th, and the reason I mention it after just talking about the river is because for about, I don't know, six years in a row for the Heritage Festival, I've advertised that on Saturday, September 10th, we'll go for a hike out into the river and I'll show everybody the eel dam. There's an eel dam in the Susquehanna River, likely made by Native Americans. And every year we have too much rain and we haven't done a hike to the eel dam ever. But this year we are. Yes. Yeah, eel weirs in Danville, they call it the eel dam. It's one of those weird regionalisms. Was there one near where you... Yeah. Have you ever eaten eel? Okay. <laughs> I'm told smoked eel is the way to do it. That's smoked eel. It's supposed to be really good. Right. Susquehanna. That's great. Well, if you want to hike with me to an eel weir in Danville, I think we're going to pull it off. Now watch. Well, all of a sudden, Schnedeker will be lying to us and we'll get five days of rain. It could happen, but I mean, it's, it's like ankle deep right now. So uh, come with. So come with. You don't even need to be able to swim. It's ankle deep in Danville anyway. So. But it's a fun heritage festival. Uh, I'm doing an iron ore mine hike. Uh, Friday night of the festival where I take folks on a, on a hike back in old rail line where there used to be iron ore mining and um, it's going to be great. Alf, are you doing some blacksmithing this year, do you think? Okay, he's going to forge some, some iron. It's going to be a great, great, great festival. So. so come on up and ask questions if you didn't catch all that or just if you're web savvy, just search online, Danville Heritage Festival. 
I had to plug my hometown. I had to. So. All right, this song is going to connect our two towns. Um, I grew up in Danville, and I got sick and tired of seeing Williamsport getting all the credit for lumber history. Don't get me wrong. They've got their lumber history. But by golly, so does the North Branch. And uh, I'll give you some numbers. Can I borrow your book for a minute? <clears throat> This book is long out of print. This is not a sales pitch because I don't, I have one copy of my own book and Alf and his mom brought a copy tonight. But in my book, I couldn't remember these numbers. Here it is. Listen to this. From the 18th to the 23rd of May in 1833. <clears throat> I'm not emotional. I'm just choking on some dust. So what's that? Five days. Five days in May in 1833. This is in Danville. So your river, Tawanda. <clears throat> 2,688 arcs went by Danville and 3,480 log rafts. So that averages out to 1,000 rafts or arcs per day or between one to two rafts every minute of daylight. Think about that. That's, that's, it's not quite Interstate 80, but it's Route 6. It's Route 6. So, I mean, the numbers are there. The amount of white pine that came down the North Branch was, in its time, as big as what later came down the West Branch. It was just different decades. And if you're wondering, well, why aren't there many photographs of it? 1830s, folks, there weren't photographs. There's some beautiful carvings. Uh, one of my favorites is it's exactly that. It's a carving where people would take either clay or wood and they'd carve a scene in it, and then they'd stamp that in ink and on paper. Uh, and there's one you can Google. It's, it says, making up rafts along the Erie Railroad, a scene near Tawanda, Pennsylvania. And uh, it's beautiful. It's got them skidding the white pine logs using a team of oxen right to the river. And then in, in, the, in the background, you can see them assembling log rafts that would have gone right down the river to Marietta, Lancaster County. And that's what this song is about. Oh, the war, it was over, Mr. Lincoln had won. I drew my Navy wages and returned to my home, to Sullivan County where my grandfather came. The soil was rocky and the sky always rain. I remember Grandpa's stories of when he was a kid, a bison in the lowlands and elk on the ridge. But now they're all gone and a new hunt has begun to find the tie of dot and net and make the sawmills hum. All I need is my cross-cut saw, my double-bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around, my soul's being tempted by that high water sound. Up on the loyal sock, it's straight and it's tall, there is pine up there like you ain't never saw. Only brave loggers bear the winter cold, and the snow falls heavy on the Appalachian fold. For it's up in the morning at 5 a.m. Throw down some biscuits, some coffee and ham. A 12-hour shift with a Teamster crew. Skidding logs to the water through the ice and snow. All I need is my cross-cut saw, my double-bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around, and my soul's being tempted by that high water sound. And we lash our logs together with hickory and oak. No rope, no iron, just pins and bows. A sweep at the front and back and a shack for the crew. 20,000 board feet ready to tie loose. When the ice finally breaks and the water's good and high, we'll head down the loyal sock, our crew of five. A day on the raft down to Montoursville. We hit the Susquehanna where the water's smooth and still. All I need is my cross-cut saw, my double-bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around, and my soul's being tempted by that high water sound. Once we get to Marietta, we sell off our logs, $100 split by five river hogs, and we head back north, walking all the way, with a hand on your knife and the other on your pay. 
Well, if it's a good season, we'll have two or three more runs. Then this year is over and summer has begun. I'll watch as the rust, it builds on my tools. And I'll long for the day I'm back with my logging crew. All I need is my crosscut saw, my double bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around, and my soul's being tempted by that high water sound. If you're like, now wait, you said North Branch, and then you're mentioning Loyal Sock Creek and Montoursville. Well, I know, I know. I was talking about our river, but I wrote that song about the Loyal Sock. But I still cut Williamsport out pretty nicely, didn't I? I don't have an anti-Williamsport vibe. Far from it. I'm just more like, okay, that's great. You have your story, but let the rest of us get our story told. I love the Pennsylvania Lumberman's Museum, but my, my friendly critique would be, too much Williamsport, too much railroad. You go in there and it's, it's Williamsport and railroad heavy. And uh, we, need, we need our story told too. So. But I've always been a firm believer of, instead of just complaining about this stuff, get out there and do something about it. So that's kind of why I'd write these songs, you know? And so rather than just going, well, someone ought to, I do it. I get out there and tell the stories. Well, I could go all night, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, Man, this has been a real treat for many reasons, but I, 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 I think this was the right prison for me to break into my... <laughs> like, I've never played a prison before, and this is, you know, I'm tiptoeing into what it's like. But you're the nicest group of prisoners I've ever performed to. I feel like we should do Boy Named Sue or something here. But... I know what we'll do. We had a request for a, 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 a song... And I think this will be the, a good way to close. It's not quite the one you asked for, but it's the first song I ever learned. And I bet a lot of you know it. It's called I'll Fly Away. And I thought that's, that'd be a fun one. And, and uh, we can all have our own feelings about, about prisons and the folks that lived here. But I thought, can we at least acknowledge they were human beings and, and they lived here and many of them died here. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing I'll Fly Away and invite you to sing along if you like. And uh, thank you so much to Matt for inviting me to perform for you all tonight. This was a real treat. Thank you, Matt. Here we go. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away, fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away in the morning When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away, fly away Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away Like a bird thrown driven by the storm I'll fly away, fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away in the morning When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away, fly away Here we go! I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away. Give yourselves a hand, that was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Get up and stretch your legs and buy lots of books from the museum gift shop. A question. The way it works for me, the mouth bow, I hold it kind of right up to my, on the outside, it's on my cheek, it's not on my lips, and I'm kind of manipulating the shape of my mouth.
That's how I play it. It's one of those things, as you experiment, you will feel it. You'll hit, you'll hit the spot where you feel it start to resonate. Uh, when I was at that camp last summer, the one boy, I mean, he made one. It was like that tall. And I'm like, young man, what, what are you doing? He's like, I'm making a bass cannon. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. It was like low, low. But. So you can, I, I still have been experimenting. I don't know what the magic is to get the best sound, you know, but that's kind of also the scientist in me trying to get more people to bring this thing back so we can figure out, is it length? Is it arc? Is it species of wood? I've had old timers say, well, it needs to be cedar. Okay, mine's oak. It's about as far from cedar as you can get. So I'm going to try cedar next. Um, I had hardware store wire on it, and I just last week switched over to an old guitar string. I haven't made up my mind if the guitar string sounds better. I actually think the hardware store might be better than the guitar string. But Yes, another question. I don't golf and I don't watch football. I don't know. I, I think normal men have other ways of occupying their time, and I... I am a happily married man, father of two, and I'm a school teacher, and, and a lot of the stuff I do, I do with my family, so that'd probably be my answer. I keep it at home. Thank you for coming this evening, and please help yourself to the museum. It'll be open for a little while, and thanks for coming.